of the oral evidence sessions uh, recorded by Hansard. Agreed. If there's any declarations of interest uh, related to the uh, business being conducted today, now is the time to declare it. If not, we shall proceed. There's apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan, and we have uh, members Doug Beatty, Sinead Bradley, Gemma Dolan, and Paul Frew that are joining us through the teleconferencing uh, system, and they're welcome to this meeting as well. I'll ask the clerk now to advise members of any members having delegated their vote under the relevant standing order. Under standing order 1156, uh, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the chairperson, uh, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. The draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 4th of June um, pages 5 to 10 of the meeting pack uh, are available. If members are content that they're a true reflection, then I can sign them accordingly. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Matters arising, there's the forward work programme, and that's been tabled at pack uh, on pages 3 to 10, um, and it reflects decisions that were made by the committee at our Tuesday's meeting. Uh, for meetings on the 23rd of June and Tuesday the 30th of June are, are still currently listed provisionally and decisions will be taken regarding the need for those meetings on a week-by-week -week basis as previously agreed uh, by the committee. So, members, if you can note the forward work programme as outlined. Agreed. Um, I'll come back to an item of correspondence um, that the Minister for Justice has provided with us following a, a debate on the private member's motion um, that was heard in respect of prison officers, and I'll take that at the end of uh, proceedings. So we will move then, members, to taking evidence now um, as part of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Um, the first oral evidence session um, that we're going to have is from the Women's Aid Federation. Um, the relevant papers uh, for members are pages 13 to 47 of uh, the meeting pack. So we'll just allow the witness an opportunity to, to come in and then we'll commence proceedings. So if members just take their ease for one minute. Okay, members, can I formally welcome uh, Sonia McMullen, who is the Regional Services Manager from the Women's Aid Federation, to the meeting. Um, you're very welcome, Sonia. Um, thank you for coming, and uh, pleased to be able to do this face-to-face, -face, socially distanced, of course, and uh, uh, we very much appreciate you coming um, to the meeting and uh, the submission that has been made in writing from your organisation. Uh, which is very detailed and very impressive, and obviously we'll pick up on that during the uh, evidence session. Just advise we'll be recording this um, session by Hansard, and then the transcript will be published uh, on the committee web page. So I'm going to hand over to you, Sonia, to provide us with a, a, a brief overview, and then members will want to get into some specific questions in, in respect of your submission. So thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much. Um, chair and committee for inviting us to come along today. I thought it would be easier to come in person, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll be speaking on behalf of the nine local women's aid groups um, this morning, and we'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the Justice Minister for the swift action in returning the legislation in the absence of the Assembly and the Department of Justice for all the work that they did in, in trying to get the legislation through the, um, Westminster. Um, the consultation on course of control closed on the 26th of April 2016, so it's over four years since we actually formally consulted um, on the issue. So much time has passed, so Women's Aid would think that it is useful to look at the other jurisdictions, how we've moved on and what good practice has developed there. Um, our response to the Justice Committee, um, a very comprehensive document, as you can see, you know, given the opportunity, we wanted to make sure we got everything in there. But it's been informed by our local groups across Northern Ireland, staff, volunteers, 
and consultation with our member services and survivors, including a survey that was conducted very recently at the back, um, the Women's Voices. And that's really important um, for us and all the work that we would do in Women's Aid, that we consult with our women, children and young people with regard to having their voices front and centre. So I'd um, urge the committee to, to take some time to read through that, because that's the lived experience of women and what they want from a bill and a robust criminal justice system. So each women's aid group across Northern Ireland offers a range of specialist services for children and young people, as I'm sure most of you are very aware of our services. Last year we housed 654 women and 421 children in our refuge and accommodation services, and 6,000 women and over 6,000 children in our outreach support which allows them to stay in their own home, though there were 381 women who couldn't access refuge because it was full. I suppose in the context of domestic violence in Northern Ireland, sitting before a, a justice committee, we have to recognise that last year our PSNI statistics were 16% of all crime in Northern Ireland was domestic violence related crimes. And it's shocking, you know, it's higher than um, if we put theft, burglary, drug offences, possessions of weapons all together. You know, it's still um, domestic abuse um, offences or more. And that is really concerning because if we look at um, domestic violence in relation to the PSNI statistics, it is only the tip of the iceberg because we know not everyone lifts the phone up and reports as well. So it's just putting that in context. Year on year, our statistics are going up. But we do welcome that more people are feeling they can engage with the police service. So that's really important. Women's Aid across Northern Ireland, we welcome the bill. You know, as I said, we've campaigned for many years with regard to this, but we also are aware that there are more robust measures being put in place through the current domestic abuse bill going through Westminster. And it's deemed as an opportunity to transform lives and restore confidence in the legal system for victims and survivors. And that's a pretty big statement with regard to what it's hoping to do with regard to their new legislation. But we would call on all government departments to take ownership of the key issues, because without their support, no reforms to domestic violence and abuse legislation will work. It's paramount that we look at our housing departments to the, you know, through the Department for Communities. They actually fund the biggest you know, majority of money in relation to domestic violence services in Northern Ireland through supporting people, through our refuges and um, through our outreach services. Department of Justice currently doesn't fund any you know, domestic violence specific services and the Department of Health um, funds um, the federation that I work for at the moment, which we're very grateful for, but that will be ending at the end of March. So um, sustainable funding is a big thing, but it needs to cross departments. You know, education, if we look at every document that's been produced over the last 10, 20 years with regard to reforms to domestic violence abuse and indeed sexual um, offences as well, they all come back to education, you know, prevention, early intervention, and that's, you know, really key. So we would call on all departments really to work together. Our strategy you know, has been put together by the Department of Health and Department of Justice, but everybody needs to take responsibility for domestic violence. We really feel that. And um, because this bill could transform lives of all victims and survivors in Northern Ireland, and that's what we really want as well. But as I said, it does need sustainable funding to enable life-saving specialist services. Um, the, the funding sector you know, at the moment, it's really, really difficult. As I say, you know, the federation that I work for, our funding will be up at the end of March. And it's so hard working year on year. You know, and previously when I worked in the helpline, it was the same until the service went out for tender. It was year on year as well. So we really need um, a commitment because investment now will save money later without a shadow of a doubt. So we would ask our Justice Committee to consider the following omissions that aren't included in the proposed legislation. You asked within the um, written submission if there was any other legislative or non-legislative approaches to tackling domestic abuse that aren't currently in place. So we would like you to um, look at the statutory gender definition of domestic violence and abuse. It would and should explicitly name the gendered nature of domestic abuse to truly reflect the reality of the crime. And we would really like you to consider this as at present we are the only part of the UK that doesn't recognise domestic violence and abuse as a gendered crime. 
and we would call on you to recognise violence against women and girls and have a strategy to acknowledge this. The Home Office in England has a four-year strategy for violence against women and girls. In Scotland, they have their equally safe strategy to eradicate violence against women and girls. And in Wales, they have the Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence Wales Act 2015. So we are the only part, again, of the UK that isn't looking at that. Um, domestic Abuse Commissioner. We will continue to actively campaign for a domestic abuse commissioner, and we feel it's essential. It's an accountable mechanism for scrutinising legislation, policy, practice, um, commissioning and um, provision of services. And certainly during COVID-19, um, we have seen um, liaison with the sector in England and Wales, um, how good the provision of the commissioner has been. They speak to the commissioner once a week. Um, all of the services do, and it has been key in securing the £76 million for emergency um, COVID money for specialist domestic violence services in England and Wales. So we'll continue to um, campaign in relation to that. And if we're looking at the introduction of domestic homicide reviews, for example, piloting domestic violence courts, and even the rollout of this legislation, having a commissioner or a scrutiny committee or something like that to be able to oversee and rule that out would be to the benefit of the Assembly, I would feel as well, to the benefit of the domestic um, violence and abuse sector as well. Um, reforms of the Family Court, we know that that's not within our bill, but the Westminster Government last year had a three-month review of the Family Court, and we feel in Northern Ireland it really is something that is essential. And that review was built um, on the draft domestic abuse bill with an expert of panels. And the aim was to ensure the courts work in the explicit interest of the children, and we need to deliver a safe family court. Domestic violence does not end at that point of separation, and I think we, we all um, know that. Many women never reach the criminal court, but are in the family court many times. And there should also be special protection measures there. If someone's a vulnerable and intimidated witness in a criminal court, they're a vulnerable and intimidated witness in a family court and in civil proceedings also. So we would you know, appreciate looking at those special measures and those protections. Child contact, a huge issue. And we need a systematic change to child contact with a perpetrator of domestic violence. And of course, the safety of the child um, during contact is um, essential. powers to deal with domestic abuse and um, we are really encouraged that um, the Department of Justice is looking at the consideration of the domestic abuse protection orders and notices and currently in Northern Ireland there is none of that emergency provision to remove a perpetrator for 24 hours from the home and we would really welcome the introduction of those orders and notices. Given that the domestic violence protection orders and notices, they've been in place for over 10 years and have come across you know, major criticism if you look at some of the evaluations of same. So whenever something new, I know it's being piloted at the moment, but you know, it would fit really well to have all of those remedies in place, including the non-molestation order, occupation order, restraining orders, undertakings, and then having the notices um, as well and orders. Um, we really do think that they, you know, they're robust. They also, um, if breached, are a criminal offence. And also, it's, um, they'll take into consideration coercive and controlling behaviour, which is really important if you're bringing in a new order um, and we're changing the legislation that it's not just for a physical offence. So um, we welcome your, um, your views around that. Housing then, you know, it is um, mentioned and um, and is named within the domestic abuse bill that is going through um, Westminster. We know that we have different legislation and policies here, and it wouldn't just one size fit all. But we do think there should be ring fencing of funding for refuge services. And in England and Wales, they're looking at secure tenancies for those fleeing domestic violence and abuse. And you know, domestic violence is one of the major causes of homelessness. You know, at the beginning of the session here, I've said that 381 women couldn't get refuge last year because they were full. So the realisation is that that home still is not a safe place, even with the legal remedies to remove people from the home. Um, home still just sometimes is not safe and you will need refuge. 
Other issues then with regard to the investigation and prosecution of new offences, um, we would call for more resources. And as I said previously, investing now, you know, can save you so much money later. And if we look at some of the police forces, England, Scotland and Wales, they have all ruled out domestic abuse matters training. Um, it has been costly, but it is a huge investment that each of the police forces are, are taking. And um, we would be minded that you know that our police force um, really need to roll out some training for first responders, but for for all um, members of the police force. We go to Garneville and are involved in um, the training of new recruits, but it's um, just for an hour. But we really appreciate it. we've been doing that for many years. So there's need for better evidence to be produced in cases as well to enable more cases to go through the criminal justice system. You know, I've been in women's aid for over 20 years and. We're still talking about people withdrawing and not engaging in the system, and you know, and why is that? And if we look at some of the reviews for um, Gillen, for example, in relation to serious sexual offences, there's a lot of those recommendations that are very valid and relevant to domestic violence cases as well. And one of them is that independent advocate. And we've had MARACs in place for over 10 years, the Multi Agency Risk Assessment Conference, but we don't have the independent um, violence advocate. So the IDVAs are still not in place. And Women's Aid do take that role. And, um, but obviously, we don't get paid for it, but the role of an independent advocate to support the victim who is a witness in a case, we feel, you know, and there's research to back that up, will encourage less withdrawal and um, the introduction of the new offence of domestic abuse to include physical and psychological harm. Well, there's a lot of training going to be involved in relation to that. And if we look at the Sijini um, recommendations, you know, 10 years ago, they were looking at the introduction of IDFAs, you know, piloting domestic violence courts. PSNI training, the PPS to review um, case files as well. And you know, fast forward to last year and the Sajini recommendations, they're still saying the same things as well. Because that's good practice and that's what we need to instill, you know, a good criminal justice system that people, you know, will have confidence in, because that's really what we want. And that's what we all have an opportunity to do now here. So um, we also would um, welcome, and we do welcome, the stalking legislation, and the Minister has talked about um, looking at that later on in the year, and also um, fatal and non-fatal strangulation. There's a steering group that has been, um, that is happening soon, so we welcome that. And Operation Encompass, it would be remiss of me not to um, mention that um, as well. So I think I've gone over my 10 minutes probably. but. Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity. We have um, drilled into the bill and have specific responses in relation to the clauses of the actual drafted legislation. So I'm happy, you know, to take any questions from the committee. Thank you very much. Sonia, thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the overview around the work that the organisation is doing, and uh, a general commentary around the bill and its intention. So, if I can just start, and forgive me for just trying to be quite clinical around the clauses, because ultimately. Um, you know, we're about trying to get the best legislation um, in terms of what's going through the Assembly. So I, I want to try and keep it as focused as we can around what has been proposed in, in, in these various clauses. And it picks up on some of the comments that, that you have made, I suppose. The, the first one that I, I wanted to ask about was um, the statutory gender definition. Um, as to, to why women's aid feel it needs to be defined as women and girls. Um, the Westminster legislation that's going through at the minute is gender neutral. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also other submissions that we've received that are advocating a gender neutral position to be taken on it. So if you can just tell me why um, there's a, a need for it um, to, to be around women and girls, and I've read your submission, I know we were yeah. citing the Istanbul Convention and so on around that, but mm -hmm. just so I know, why, why would that be necessary in legislation to make it an effective uh, piece of law that then can, can lead to prosecution? Well, again, if we're looking at good practice, and I also, you know, I stated there that England, Scotland and Wales were the only part of the UK that don't recognise violence against women and girls. And it is a gendered form of violence. And if we look at um, other forms, such as honour-based violence, female genital mutilation, all of these things, we're, we're not taking them into account here in Northern Ireland. And that's what a lot of the, you know, the, the other pieces of strategy that, that would be um, 
introduced and be in the other jurisdictions. You know, we really feel domestic abuse is a form of violence against women. Um, it's a cause and consequence of women's inequality. And not only are women far more likely to be victims and men perpetrators, but they're more um, overwhelmingly likely to experience that fear as well. You know, it's really important when we look at our police statistics as well. You know, 69% victims female, 31% male. But if we drill in then and look at the offenders, 86% of the offenders are male and 12% are female. And so it's really important that we look at statistics and we refer to them correctly. At the moment, our statistics are slightly skewed because a lot of um, um, cases where police will go out to a house and a man will say, well, she hit me, and she'll say, no, you know, he hit me. And so it's like, well, there's no evidence here to show who's, you know. And we have cases where people have non-molestation orders out against each other and they're living in the same home. Mm -hmm. So it's skewing the records there as well. But we really think it's time for our assembly to look at, um, you know, complying, yes, with the Istanbul Convention and also, you know, with regard to other um, human rights legislations. Um, we've had a gender neutral policy here in Northern Ireland um, forever. And we recognise, of course, you know, I worked in the helpline for over 20 years and we had lots, I spoke to lots of male callers over the years, um, very, very genuine um, victims of domestic violence. So it's not about taking away, you know, from that, but it's about um, recognition of domestic violence being a gendered crime, and it is. And we feel that the Assembly really has never taken that on board. You know, why would England, Scotland, Wales invest? You know, £10 million pounds has been invested in the Home Office strategy, the four year strategy. And if we look at um, sexual offences, for example, as well, you know, the perpetrators are more often, you know, male as well. And it's not about um, a hierarchy of victims, you know, in relation to one deserving of more, it's just that recognition that it is um, a gender-based crime around power and um, equality as well. well I, I'm trying to, to square the issue around recognition and the issue around what would be an effective piece of law that would ensure that people can be prosecuted. So um, I, I'm just trying to, to see if there's any evidence that would say if it was a gender-neutral piece of law, then women are going to be less likely to get protection and prosecution secured by the current wording. So I, I'm not, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to what you're saying and I can understand it. I'm trying to square off how do we deal with um, capturing men that suffer domestic abuse and then the evidence that we've got around gay and bisexual and transgender and so on. You know, what does the legislation need to, to then start specifying all of the different genders and then within that the different um, sexual identity orientations that are then reflected in domestic abuse that takes place. So, um, Well, I think if the Westminster Bill is looking at a gender-neutral definition to include everyone, we totally appreciate where they're coming from with regard to that. But they have the backup of a strategy, an individual strategy. So is that an opportunity that we go for a gender-neutral definition in relation to our legislation? But we do back it up by having an individual strategy mm -hmm. to recognise um, violence against women and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, because all of the Which evidence what, the it other, shows where the, yeah. the vast majority of these cases it's women, it's girls centred, mm -hmm. and I think it's right to make that point. Um, but it's very important to recognise all the other minority groups that you have stated as yeah. well. Absolutely, and it shouldn't be to the detriment of another group. Yeah. Um, in terms of the domestic abuse um, commissioner. The, the call to have a, a standalone commissioner. Kind of two questions I just want to ask. Is that a, a standalone commissioner for Northern Ireland? Would it be expanding the scope of a domestic abuse commissioner at a UK wide level that would include Northern Ireland? Uh, w or would there be scope even? I know your paper cites the work of the Victims Commissioner in England and Wales. Mm -hmm. um, and is there scope in Northern Ireland to widen the scope of the Victims Commissioner? 
here as well. I'm just keen to get your thoughts on, yeah, on how that would look. I would, think we would welcome you know, further discussion on all of that, because our Vic Victims Commissioner here in Northern Ireland is only troubles related. You know, um, I follow the work of Dame Vera Bird, the Victims Commissioner in England, and she's fabulous, and she's a great champion for all um, victims and survivors of domestic and sexual violence. So, of course, that's you know, some, an avenue worth um, pursuing. The Domestic Abuse Commissioner is one for England and Wales. Um, in Scotland, they don't have one, but um, they have quite robust remedies and a very good link in you know, with government and a minister and things like that in relation to um, domestic abuse. But really, I suppose it's around... Um that overseeing and that scrutinisation, you know, someone to go to. Um, and um, we would be welcome, you know, we know it's it's a lot of money. Um, you know, I think the Justice Minister had looked at over a million pounds for an office, for example, for a, a domestic abuse commissioner. But we do feel having that go-to person, and there's so much going on, we are quite behind in relation to legislation, in relation to our protection orders and notices. You know, they came into place in England and Wales 10 years ago. You know, we have a lot of catching up with the absence of the Assembly as well. So I think we would be open to lots of discussions, and, and that's something I hadn't personally thought about with regard to the role of our, our Victims Commissioner as well. So I know we're getting a mental health champion and we have an older persons commissioner and a children and young persons commissioner as well. And it's, um, it's about that scrutinisation, being able to um, oversee you know, the implementation of this bill, for example, to, um, to make sure all the training um, and the resources are there. And as I said, during COVID-19, the commissioner has been so essential with regard to securing um, the extra money for um, domestic abuse services um, in England and Wales. And um, we've put a few questions to ourselves. And um, it is a part-time post now. It was a three-day-a-week post originally. And they have extended it now from COVID to a four-day-a-week post. So, so that's interesting too. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a full-time post. It could be, you know, part-time. Um, I think um, with regard to integrating it into you know England and Wales it would be difficult our legislation is different we have so many things that are different especially in relation to housing um, and local authorities and, and all that sort of you know um, everything is a little bit different in Northern Ireland to um, the rest of the UK so I don't know if it, it would integrate that um, smoothly but look we're really open for conversations um, I know um, Linda we discussed you know would us you know different options and models of this previously as well and looking at a, a, a scrutiny committee or something like that we just feel that we need something there to um, to be able to oversee the implementation, especially of the new legislation, and hold people to account. And that's holding the voluntary sector to account as well as um, the statutory sector too. But there's an awful lot of work that will be um, going on now um, with the introduction of the legislation. Okay. And on the, the you mentioned the stalking legislation. There's been some commentary that, that this bill should have included that, and obviously it's open to the committee to to bring forward its own amendments if it's so mm -hmm. desired, but I would be keen to know your view. Are you content? Uh, maybe that's not the right phrase, but the Minister has said that there will be a separate standalone yeah. piece of legislation mm -hmm. on stalking. Would that be the preference of Women's Aid, that we would we would go with a separate standalone or seek to have legislation included into this bill? Well, we were really happy to hear the um, Justice Minister mention that in the last debate, you know, with regard to um, stalking legislation. There's a, a huge correlation between stalking, coercive control and domestic violence and abuse. I suppose a lot of the media portrayal would be that it is, um, you know, strangers, you know, when it's these crazy people and celebrities it only affects. But I think, you know, looking at um, Alison Morris and different people that have come forward this year and told their stories of stalking, and we are content um, for it to be in separate legislation. We're keen for the stalking protection orders to be rolled out in Northern Ireland as well. But again, it's another um, example. Um, those orders are only as good as the training for the police you know, service in relation to the implementation um, of the orders. So it's another huge piece of work you know, with regard to the rolling out for our, our police force as well. But we are... are um, 
we're, we're very content um, that you know we move mo move on with that and if it is a separate piece of legislation that's okay we are aware of the mandate of the assembly and the time ticking away as well you know but um, things seem to be moving you know very um, swiftly if we look at the introduction of the bill even during COVID and everything you know so so we are very encouraged by the Department of Justice how quickly they are moving on with things so we well, would be happy with I know we're that. we're seeking to expedite our committee role in half the time as normal to try and help that process so yeah um, we appreciate that, those comments. I want to bring other members in, and then there may be some that I just want to pick up on specifically around aspects of the clauses. Um, but uh, Linda, if you want to, to come in, and then there's members, um, Sonia, there's four other members that are dialed in on the conference call, and I'll come to them shortly. Sorry, just sorting out the mic. Uh -huh. um, just a, a couple of issues, Sonia. Obviously, we did have that conversation around the Commissioner, and I'm certainly not opposed to the idea of a Commissioner. Um, just probably want to scope out in a wee bit greater detail whether that's the best option. And, and one of the things that I had actually said is that I don't believe that our all party groups are used to best effect. And is that an avenue that could be an oversight or a scrutiny around the implementation? Because there is an awful lot of implementation that has to be um, scrutinised and, and a close eye kept on it. And I think that it is important because the value of any legislation or any policy is its implementation, not the legislation itself. You know, and, and that's a conversation I've had around many pieces of legislation that have come through. The, the, the value of them is not, it's great having this if, it, if it's not implemented correctly. So I do think that, that you are 100 percent on the button in terms of the implementation has to be scrutinised and we we'll have to ensure that it's done effectively. And the training around um PSNA is something that I've raised repeatedly and I know that um our members on the policing board have as well. And I think it's something that will actually there will be a focus on it in the policing board. Mm -hmm. So I do think there would be there's a good opportunity there um you know that there are obviously a number of different meetings in terms of the policing board. There's not just the public meeting, there are the committee meetings and the the private policing board full board meeting. So I think that that's a good place to scrutinise the the PSNA end of it and how they implement it and how they're trained and how effectively they use it. Because I am concerned that even some of the the things that we already have in place in terms of legislation and, and tools that are there that could be used are not being used correctly because the officers or the PSNA as, a, as an organisation don't fully understand them and how they can be used to their greatest effect. So I think that it's important that that piece of work is done and, and how it's done as well I think is important in terms of between the judiciary and the PSNA. And, and everybody understanding what their role is in it, because I was interested actually in in, in something what you that you said around the the family courts, and I find it in in the non malls as well that repeatedly victims are being brought back to court, and I think that's a failure of the PPS in terms of of how they are representing the victims. So I think there's a piece of work to be done around that as well. And again, that's a scrutiny role, you know, and how, how, do we, how do we keep an eye on that? So for me, I think all of those are things that need to be looked at. The Operation Encompass is something that I have raised, Sonia, um, even prior to this. In my, in my previous role on the policing board, I had raised it with the PSNA about how could, you know, where is the legislative gap? So I've, I've asked them that question. And we are waiting for information back in relation to that. If there's a legislative gap, is there an amendment that we can put in mm. to this legislation or can it be done in some other way to ensure that Operation Encompass can be rolled out here? Because I think it's extremely important that when a young person is the victim of or witnesses an uh, incident of domestic abuse in the home, that that information is passed on to the school the next morning before that child comes in because that will make all the difference 
to how they are treated when they do come in. You know, if their uniform is not right, if they don't have something to eat, if they don't have their homework done, if they're not in good form. I just think that would make a world of difference to a child who is in a home where domestic abuse is, is going on. So it's it's all part of it. I think it's as important as any of the, the other legislation. So for me, I will keep a focus on that, on that part of it because I think it is important that we get something in place around that. We had also, um, in the 26 counties, put in the special leave for victims of domestic abuse. And that is something that I think we as a committee certainly should look at. Um, in terms of an amendment to the to this legislation, we have put a question into the finance minister in terms of you know would he be prepared to look at it for civil service staff. So I think that's a first step, but you would like it to be much wider. It, it would be an inequity if you only had some people in some jobs entitled to it. So for me, I think that's important that we we look at that. The non models again is something that that I have raised repeatedly in terms of affordability for the working poor, which many women, if they're not already, when they're in the relationship, become whenever they try to leave that relationship. So that, that's something I think we need to keep a close eye on as well. Um, just around the, the housing and homelessness, the committee has also written to, just for, for your information, and you probably already have it, but we've written to the um, Minister of for Communities around looking at the points system because currently there is there are not points awarded in terms of intimidation if you're a victim of domestic abuse but there is if it's sectarian religious um, you know any of the other groups so racism whatever you, you, you'll get points but you won't get points if you're the victim of domestic abuse which is intimidation so that is something we've asked the, the minister to look at and I'm not sure whether we haven't had a full response back to that, so I'm not sure whether that will require just a policy change mm -hmm. or whether it's something that will require legislation. But again, it's something that we'll follow up, and I think it does fall within um, DFC's remit, and, and we will chase it up because it's important for us to know that that's been dealt with. It's an element of this. Um, just in relation then to... Um, the chairs already, I suppose, queried this around the violence against women and girls, and you know whether that's this is the right place for it. And I'm not sure, and and whether it is or not, I'm not opposed to it or, or for it. But I am sure that you're right on the point around there needs to be something in place. There needs to be some kind of strategy. All of the stuff that's come forward, even from Justice Gillen around the sexual violence and, and now the domestic abuse bill and, and all of the course of control and the stalking, we know that most of the perpetrators are male, regardless of whether the victims are male or female. Yeah. So I do think that, that there does need to be something done around that. There are many, many crimes that women are more likely to be the victims of. So a strategy maybe is potentially the better way because it's much greater than just domestic abuse and it's much greater than just this piece of legislation. So I think that the committee would certainly be interested in, in looking at that and it probably, to be fair, goes across all of our committees or at least a number of them um, in terms of how we deal with that. So I think that is something we, we should look at. The protection orders and notices... Um, I'm a wee bit concerned about that. Some some of the things that we're asking for is the minister has said that she will bring in, in secondary legislation, and I think the intention would be possibly to bring that through in the miscellaneous bill. And I've raised this: if we can be absolutely certain that the miscellaneous bill is going to be brought through the assembly, then that's that's fine. But we don't have much time left in this mandate, and we do have a substantial amount of work already in terms of this committee so I would like some reassurance that from the minister so again that's that's something for us to follow up but just to reassure you and the independent advocate I think is absolutely essential I would agree with you in relation to that even if it's only to help the victim to understand the system and how it works and how the PPS works and the PS9 rule and you know what what their role is, what their 
um, legal representative's role is, what the PPS role is, what the PSNA role is, because that is extremely difficult for any victim, to be honest with you. And to be fair, it maybe is something again that could be looked at in a much wider context. But specifically, we know that in terms of this type of crime, that the low rate of, of yeah, getting to court. So for that reason, I do think we need to put something in place. There has to be somebody or something in place there to assist the victims. And I think that that is, is vital in terms of increasing the numbers of people who are brought to court and who face the judicial system and hopefully who face the punishment that they deserve. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have, and I've raised this in the chamber and I've raised it in this committee before, is, and, and I think we have to find a way as a committee of getting this out there, that society do not see domestic abuse as a community problem. They do not see it as a problem for society. They see it as a problem that is within somebody's home and that's their issue and not ours. And even people who you would think would definitely view it as a societal problem just don't. You know, people who are very aware of domestic abuse, even victims, even people who support victims, women's groups, are not, don't seem to recognise it yet as being a societal problem in a community problem and a crime that is a crime against the community and society, not just something that happens within the home that is the business of those within that home. So I think we, we have a, a role to play in that, Chair, and the Minister certainly has a role to play in it, and I think that we should, I suppose, push harder in relation to that, in trying to ensure that people understand that a crime like this that happens within the home is no different than if somebody is attacked on the street. They suffer the same and actually worse because the person, the perpetrator, the person who's doing this is the very person who's supposed to protect you, who's supposed to love you, who's supposed to care about you, and you're in the place where you should be most safe, which is in your home. So I think that's something that we need as a committee to, to look at how we can do more work around highlighting, and certainly, as I say, the minister needs to, to look at it. But I suppose I don't actually really have any questions, Sonia, because you, you're, you're brief and... The conversations we've had before and your brief today really, I suppose, highlights what the issues are for you. And I just wanted to give you some reassurance around yeah. the issues that, that we as a committee would hopefully be looking at and will be taking up. And certainly I, as a, a member of this committee and as um, our, our spokesperson on justice, would be focusing on. OK, thank you, Linda. Um, Paul Frew, you've indicated you, you want to ask a question. And if, if I can encourage you to keep it to the, the legislation and the clauses and, and seek specific responses from, from Sonia in respect of that. I would appreciate it. OK, well, you know me, Chair. Uh, I do. So, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the committee. I can't see you in person, but I can certainly hear you loud and clear. Um, can I ask, first of all, go into your concerns? And uh, on, on one that I probably don't agree with, so we'll do the, the, that one first. And that is you know, the belief that Clause 12, uh, the reasonable clause, should be removed. Uh, I, I hardly think reasonableness should be a uh, good defence mechanism in most laws uh, because of, you, you don't want to make it so arduous and penalise people and have the law used as a weapon against people. So there has to be some sort of reasonableness clause there. What's your, what, why have you come to this consideration that, or determination that the clause should be removed uh, from the... OK, so hopefully you covered the, the clause 12, it's yeah. the, okay. the defence on the grounds of reasonableness. Of reasonableness. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose we understand why it was drafted um, into legislation. You know, it's there to protect family members, for example, if someone has dementia or, or something um, like that, and maybe, you know, confined or controlled, so it may be in their, their own interest. But um, it can be used, and we are concerned that the defence will use it, and it will be manipulated and used by abusers. And 
and that's really it. You know, um, it's really possible for a perpetrator to present as a reasonable person, as we know. There's an awful lot of manipulation in relation to domestic violence um, and abuse and perpetrators. So, you know, we feel that that doesn't outweigh the other. So it is a great concern to women's aid, and that's why we are calling on cla the clause to be removed. You know. Without reasonable safeguards, which haven't been outlined within the um, the clause, you know, what would the safeguards that could be put in place to protect victims of domestic violence? Um, you know, especially if you look at mental health, for example, um, as someone who has supported many women for um, many years, there's not one person who's come that I've spoken to that hasn't lost their sense of self and has poor mental health. Um, you know, so. That's often used against them, and um, so we do have concerns that um, it will be used by the defence. And after consultation with some defence lawyers, they have said, "Yeah, of course it will be, and it will be, you know, used to their benefit." So that's why we're calling on it um, to be removed. And if it's not removed, an outline of details, safeguards that would be put in place that are very, very specific um, to assure the safety. In relation to that reasonable person test. Yes, yeah, so you, you, you wouldn't be uh, afraid to actually tightening up the, the, the grounds for reasonableness as opposed to removing it completely? Well, our, um, we would be calling for it to be removed, and um, that is our statement, and that is what we are saying within um, you know, our response, and that's a collective response from the whole of Women's Aid. But indeed, if it is um, to remain, um, we would be, of course, you know, we would want to look at those safeguards in place and what they would look like to um, to make sure that we are um, keeping, you know, women safe with regard to the, you know, this clause on the grounds of reasonableness. Okay, uh, it strikes me that it strikes me that a lot of this law will be enacted uh, through a process and series of evidence gathering. Sessions anyway, because the very nature of domestic violence and the operation of the police and gathering evidence, especially in coercive controlling situations. Uh, so you could you could understand then that it's not just a one-off incident that's being uh, enforced or, or being um, taken through court. So is that not a defence in itself for the? Issues you raise around the reasonableness clause, whereby where where a very shrewd perpetrator will be trying to use any grounds for defence around reasonableness, and you know something, every solicitor, barrister, and accountant will try and defend their uh, client uh, and, and i.e. perpetrator. Uh, if, if the guilt is surely surely a build up of evidence can erode that defence. Sorry, Paul. If you j just summarise that a little bit more for us, because it, it, it's a bit muffled at our end. So, if you can just concisely make that point uh, and clearly for us. So, so with, with, a, with a diary of evidence gathered on domestic violence and control uh, behaviour, uh, cause of control and behaviour, surely, surely that is will around the defence of reasonableness for a perpetrator. So a, 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 a series of offences, you mean, um, yeah. when, you, when you say diary? Uh, evidence, probably a, a multiple, multitude of times. Okay, um, thank you, Paul. I think I've got that. But um, I think, really, again, it's back to those safeguards. There would be no guarantee that a diary of evidence um, that would be gathered in relation to course of and control and behaviours would be enough here. Because we don't have regulations or safeguards, you know, we don't know what that will look like. So until we we see what those safeguards would be, um, you know, how do you prove, you know? Um, so so we would just be concerned and would like to to know, um, you know, what safeguards would formally be put in place with regard to that clause. Okay, and um, clause seven, you have an issue with seven. C, which is sending a notice uh, to be served by post to the person's, person's proper address. Can you just explain to me what, why that is a massive problem? 
Look, that's just historical, Paul, to be honest. Um, people have been served um, orders via post and um, never received them, and then women don't know when the order's in place or when it started. And um, so that's a very historical issue in relation to um, um, women's aid, which has been going on for many years. That person needs to be handed that. That person needs to be given it um, and read a specific clause with regard to the seriousness of this issue. Sentence something by second class post doesn't really, um, for us, emphasise the importance um, of that. Okay, thank you. And on the piece about stopping legislation, I, mean, I, I have thought about this a lot. And whilst I do believe that it's neater to do two separate pieces of legislation, there is massive overlap in coercive control, stalking and domestic violence. The problem I see with adding a clause on stalking to this bill is the actual offence itself. The domestic abuse offence deems that you have to um, you have to be connected, personally connected to each other at the time. Um, so, so to me, you're having to create another offence within the domestic abuse bill. Um, and I don't know how... Of course, it can always be clawed. You know, something can be defined. But what's your feeling of that? Is, is it the case that we could insert a simple clause now to try and enhance protection for stalking victims? until we get to a point where we have a stalking bill. Um, thank you, Paul. I think in relation to stalking legislation, of course, it has to be relevant for everyone, not just people who are related, you know, and connected um, within the definition within the, do the domestic abuse bill. So it would have to be a stalking um, legislation that would be for for the strangers and you know applicable for everybody, um, as mentioned previously. So it's whatever is the best, you know. Um, I suppose that's what we are thinking. You know, less haste sometimes. You know, it's it's sometimes better to sit back and reflect. We've waited quite a long time for this legislation, so let's get it right. Um, we um, were quite happy for it to go through a separate legislation um, to include the stalking protection orders and notices as well. At the moment, we have the protection from harassment order, which is very outdated and um, you know, doesn't meet the needs of those people who are harassed and stalked at this time. And we don't have anything that fits, you know, but it's around that connection. Um, so we, you know, I think Personally, probably, I think it, the separate legislation would be more beneficial and more robust. Um, but again, it's about the time and the mandate of this assembly, and you know, time is ticking away. So, of course, that that is of grave concern for us. Um, I, I do think you need to have maybe some sort of clause in the domestic abuse bill to cover that in the interim period. Um, just, just on your, I'm not going to go into the housing issue because I just think that's a no-brainer. I do think that we need some sort of um, clause there that helps victims get housing, and that will prevent domestic violence and allow the victim to remove themselves from the environment uh, where they their abusive environment. So that's a no-brainer. I'll not go into that. I'm interested that the last point here I want to make. Uh, I want to talk about the strangulation offence. And, and why you need, why you consider that to need to stand alone, was in relation to strangulation um, before. Um, COVID happened and all the rest of it. Um, Foil Women's Aid were actually having a, um, a two-day conference, and they were. Um, it was opened up for the public prosecution and legal prosecutors and things like that. We also had been approached by. Um, um, rape crisis in the south to look at um, if we wanted to come together to look at the the um, a change in legislation in relation to strangulation. It is not perceived, you know, to be as serious as it is. If you look at some of the research that's been done by um, Kath White, for example, who is the the, the lead medical 
person at the St Mary's Sexual Assault Referral Centre, um, they did a very robust piece of research that showed that um, um, monitoring a number of people who um, were the victims of non-fatal strangulation ended up dying a high percentage by strangulation. I think in relation to our dash forms and our risk assessment tools that we have at the moment, everything needs to be changed and it's about that heightened level. If just that one thing is ticked about somebody choking or um, you know, putting their hands around your neck, um, that one tick should get you through to a marrack because of the high risk. You know, it's likely to cause serious injury or death. It's perceived by the victim as a direct threat to your life, and it is, you know, a predictor of future homicide. And that's how serious it is. And we've seen the, you know, the rough sex defence, and and many of those cases have come through of late as well. Many of them have been where, you know, people have been in a, a relationship, and there has been forms of domestic violence is there. And you know, we have to look at um, intimate partner sexual violence as well, which there isn't enough awareness of as well. So we're looking at, you know, within the um, documentation that we presented to you, there's the New Zealand law on strangulation, and it shows you some of the changes that are being made. We do welcome now the Department of Justice has, um, um, I got an invitation to attend um, a, a steering group you know, to start looking at this, and the Justice Minister did mention it in the the last debate on the bill that she is interested in starting the conversation around this. So I think it's part of the bigger picture. There's an awful lot of um, pieces of legislation, um, implementation in relation to policy, good practice, that um, Northern Ireland have to catch up on. And certainly strangulation is something that we really want to, um, to um, start the discussion of changing you know, our law here in Northern Ireland. Okay. Uh Chair, I think we could pick up that New Zealand law on strangulation just to have a deeper look at it. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Rachel. Thank you. Um, I think Paul's been looking at my questions. Uh -huh. He's asked most of them. Um, so just thank you for coming today and obviously agree with a number of the points, um, especially about the need for cross departmental working. I see a massive role for education here as well. And as you know, we need we need to start um, sort of discussing this at, at, in schools, you know, about what healthy relationships are and what the signs are. And I think that would bring a, a lot back to the growing awareness of, of what we need to do um, to tackle this. But just going back to the, the commissioner, um, or a posting or scrutiny committee or critical friend of the department and statutory, statutory agencies as well as the sector. I know during the second stage um, Doug Beatty is on the line here but he called for a crime commissioner. Would that be something that you would support or would you see a specific need for a domestic abuse commissioner? I suppose you'd have to look at what is a crime commissioner, what does it look like, what is the remit, how much percentage in time would be for domestic violence, um, or indeed if it, it was a wider spectrum of um, domestic and sexual violence offences, you know, as well. Um, so you would have to look and see at what that would look like. So I think, Rachel, we're very open to discussions, you know, about different models. Um, we understand the restraints that um, the Assembly are under, both financially, you know, with regard to resourcing. So so, you know, we're just open for conversation and certainly it would be something we would be very willing to um, engage with. And, you know, looking at um, the office of the Domestic Abuse Commissioner in England and Wales, you know, it's a big office and quite a lot of staff and everything as well. You know, looking at what their, their remit is and um, obviously our population is a lot smaller and, um, you know, it, it could certainly sit within the remit, but you'd have to have someone that is very skilled and knowledgeable in all of the issues around domestic violence and abuse and that would be certainly something we would be calling for but we're certainly up for conversations around um, you know what that looks like it doesn't have to be the same you know as um, that is um, in England and Wales we could have our own unique commissioner you know um, just in to follow on again from the strangulation issue would you um like to see that included in in this bill and sort of in clause two you know maybe as part of the definition of domestic abuse yeah well it talks about sexual violence within the clause so you know it, it could be introduced but again 
Would it be the to the detriment of a stronger piece of le separate legislation? But again, we're back to the mandate and the timing and how long you know that would take. I know other jurisdictions are looking at it as well, so it, it's about looking and engaging and seeing how far they are down, down the road as well. We would welcome any um, addition, but again, it's how that would slow up this piece of legislation, and it's all about timing, um, really. And I think we're at the very early stage of our discussions around, you know, non-fatal and fatal strangulation, and looking at the research there is, you know, around other parts of the world. But we're um, um, so I hadn't thought about it being, you know, introduced within this piece of legislation. I suppose we thought it was going to be something separate because we haven't had that consultation. The steering group is only beginning now in the, the coming weeks and months, so we're at the very early stages. So. Um, I think it probably would hold up this process a lot because it's not as far down the line as other pieces of work. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the penalty levels and the sort of what can be convicted for, um, in, in terms of the offence and the aggravators, do you think that this is sufficient? Yeah, we do think it's sufficient. Um, I suppose there there is a concern around the criminalisation of young people, and we did state that around, um, you know, if there is young people who are perpetrating um, unhealthy behaviours against each other. Again, it's back to education. You don't want to criminalise a 17-year-old. You know, it's about education, healthy relationships programmes. What is available for a young person now in Northern Ireland if they do identify with challenging behaviours and want support? You know, so that's what we need to put in place um, as well. Back to looking at the disposal of crimes too. Then, Rachel, you know, if you look at um, someone who gets a sentence less than six months and they go into prison, well, what work is going to be done with them in relation to their their challenging behaviours and um, the the way they have been um, living their life? They're going to come out and they're probably going to be worse again. So, you know, those disposals and sentencing and everything needs to be looked at. Um, we have a section in there and I took it out and I put it back in around you know our perpetrator programs our non-court mandated and court mandated programs and we haven't had an awful lot of investment in that over the last number of years so we need to we don't want any money should never be taken away from victims to be put into a perpetrator program but we do, do need to look at all of that but starting as well with our early intervention, healthy relationships programs you know we need all of that through RSA we need um you know, there's so many children that don't know what a healthy relationship looks like. They don't live in a home, you know, where there's good healthy relationships, looking at values, trust, um, equality, consent, all of those issues. You know, we have our Help Enhance programme in primary school, and it's a great success for the Department of Education. So we, um, we're redoing our healthy relationships programme for post-primary. But the reality is that we still have women who were in refuge as children who are returning as adults. And we're letting people down. We really, really are. And it's all back to, um, you know, um, the education. And again, if we look at Gillen and we look at Tijini and all of the recommendations and all of those reports, they all come back to um, education. Thank you. Um, and finally, just in terms of um, the contents of the bill in around, do you think that there is enough here to tackle sort of domestic abuse and course of control behaviours on digital platforms? Does there need to be something specific put in there, or is there enough there that um, could be could be? Looked I suppose at? there's an awful lot of um, discussion at the moment around image-based violence, and certainly within Women's Aid, we have more people um, coming forward. I suppose if we look at our definition in relation to domestic violence and sexual violence, and our stopping domestic violence and abuse in Northern Ireland strategy. You know, it does talk about digital abuse and, and that abuse. So it is something that we have been talking about for um, a long time. If we look at um, we don't have harassment legislation or um, our stalking legislation, but if you look at the police statistics, I don't have them here, but around malicious communication, they have gone up huge amounts, sorry, of everything else here, but I don't have the police statistics with me. But if you look at malicious communications, it was huge. So we do need, um, you know, specifics um, around that. But I do think the bill um, does take into account, if you're looking at coercive control and behaviour, also the 
um, the sexual violence, which would incorporate, you know, the grooming, the images, all of that kind of thing. I think, and would hope that it would be interpreted in such a way. But it is such a growing area of abuse, and uh, abusers and perpetrators are always two steps ahead in relation to new things that are, you know, um, are happening. So we always have to be mindful of that um, in relation to that. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, Doug or Sinead or Gemma? Paul, Paul, can I? It's Doug, yes, Doug Beattie, can I quickly come in? Yes, go ahead, Doug Beattie. Um, first of all, Sonia, thank you for that presentation. I, I thought it was exceptional, um, uh, and, and you've given me so much more information. Um, it, it, just to be in, in brevity, um, could I just sort of join with the chair in saying I, I do have a concern over the definition being gender specific. Um, whereas I'm sympathetic, I, I, you know, I really have to think about that a little bit more. Uh, and I thank Rachel for raising the issue about uh, a, a Victims of Crime Commissioner. And, and I absolutely take your point, Sonia, that um, that person needs to know the full range of, of crimes. But, but uh, that would absolutely be part of the, the term of reference for any commissioner. So, Rachel, thank you for raising that. But, Sonia, can I just ask you, uh, and this is very, <coughs> it might not even be fair to ask you this, but we made a, a decision that... Uh, we would not piggyback the, uh, the domestic abuse legislation for England and Wales, uh, and, and we made really good reasons for that. Could, could, could I just ask you now, on reflection, when you look at their legislation to what we're proposing, did we make the right call in, in your mind? Um, thank you, Doug. I think in relation to the, the domestic abuse legislation that's going through Westminster, we were never going to get all of, all of that. Um, if you look at the bill that was going through, it was really just what we're getting now um, was part of that. The housing, the, the family court review, the commissioner, all of that was not included. Um, it was uh, um, just kind of an addition under the Northern Ireland. I, I don't know the legalities and the name. But so I suppose in relation to that, you know, we're not really getting anything more. So I think and welcome that it's it's come back to our own assembly. To Sonia, thank you. And, and, and I'm glad that sets that my mind at rest. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Sinead or Gemma, have you any questions around the clauses for Sonia? No, I'm sorry. Go on ahead, Gemma. No, I was just saying my issues have been covered, um, and Linda mentioned about the leave, which we'd be interested in. But apart from that, everything's been covered. Okay, thank you, Gemma. Shanir. Yeah, Chair. Um, firstly, can I just thank that the presentation has been exceptionally good in detail, and certainly has given me plenty of food for thought here. Um, one of the items that hasn't covered yet, Clause 9, uh, the aggravation where ch uh, relevant child is involved. And I note that women's aid are looking at uh, their specific call was that the child could be treated or recorded as a victim, um, as opposed to, because I think they're reliant on the parent making a complaint. And I would just like to take out further your thoughts on how, how you would see that actually working. I suppose, um, thank you, Sinead. Um, Women's Aid within our 10 year strategy for children and young people, we call for full recognition of children and young people as equal victims of domestic violence. And I suppose we look at that um, because children, they do see, they hear, they feel the trauma and the impact, um, you know, we all are well aware of. So, it's just something as part of our strategy, so we thought we would um, put it in there. I don't know how it how it would work, but um, children, you know, they need their own advocate in cases. You know, we we do have a concern with regard to the the collection of evidence around coercive and controlling behaviour for children and young people. How is that going to be done, and is it going to be done in a child-centred way? We see the impact of court and the family court and child contact, and all of these things in our children and young people, and the trauma, the re-traumatisation, the re-victimisation. So children need to be front and centre of um, everything, and that's, you know, we, um, together with um, the sector in England and Wales, um, you know, we're collectively calling for children to be equal victims of domestic violence. Yeah, I appreciate that because I think it's such a valid point, but um, 
I am myself just struggling to see how, how it could be framed because you're right, at the outset you think about this being the tip of the iceberg um, it, you know, we're talking about figures here and that's the people who picked up the phone and recorded but in the instance where a, a parent is motivated by the welfare of their child or if the child is actually being the access route to finding out that there is an issue um, it does seem very unfortunate that, that the child's in their own right, um, does not have a triggering mechanism somehow. And I realise that's a bit of a, mind, a, a minefield there. Um, but it's such a good point. I think it would be worthy of trying to explore it further. Okay. Thank you, um, Shay. I think as well there was something we'd like to raise around Clause 8, around that um, it... Um, you know, the aggravating factor for domestic abuse where the victim is under 18, but it doesn't cover a situation where the victim is the child of a perpetrator or the child is someone the perpetrator has response, um, parental responsibility for. So it doesn't cover a situation where the victim is the child of the perpetrator or the child is someone the perpetrator has re parental responsibility for. So it's just something to think about because there's many different dynamics within families. You know, so um, one child's getting protection there, and then there's another child that, you know, um, isn't. So just something else with regard to our children and young people. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, on the aggravating factors, I know your, your submission highlighted another series of aspects that maybe we should consider around uh, women with disabilities, mental illness, um, BME women um, as well. Um, so in, in terms of uh, trying to include them as aggravating factors, is the, the concern there that it's, it's not being covered in, in, in the legislation as currently drafted? Um, and I suppose it's what we're, how far do you cast the net you know, in terms of all of these other factors that should be included as potential aggravating factors? So in addition to you know, the offence being against a woman or a girl, but it, it was motivated by the fact that they had a mental illness or disabled and so on. Um, um, I suppose one of the pieces there, because I was doing a bit of research around that whenever I was writing it, and um, I suppose it's um, what defines you know, a, a victim and your definition of the vulnerabilities around that. You know? And I used that example from the Sentencing Council, which has decided to revise the wording to victim is particularly vulnerable. You know, so is it something about the wording that we use that takes into consideration, you know, all of those minority groups? Okay. Because there's those extra layers of complexity, you know, in relation to, um, you know, well, we were focusing on lesbian, bisexual, trans women, but of course for the whole LGBTQ community. And yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm not I've sure. Lost my train, I, thought I, I know. Sorry. I know. Sorry, I'm not sure if that's Sinead. Um, just if members on the telephone conference can mute their phones when they're, they're, they're not taking part, it would be helpful. I'm not sure which one it was, but thank you. appreciate that. Um, no, that's okay in terms of the aggravating factors. It's just something that you know, we'll need to give some consideration to. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of other clauses I just want to briefly mention, um, just so that I can cover yeah. them, um, because I'm conscious of time and we've got the, the next group that we need to hear and then... I think Linda wants to, to come in again, but then we're, we're going to need to, to wrap things up. Um, in terms of the, the clauses 15 and 16, sentencing aggravation, another aspect was about your submission talked about taking into account the abuse that has happened, not just against that woman, but where it has occurred with other women, that that should also be taken into account. I think domestic violence is a crime that um, is a repeat offence, and we, we know that from the statistics that are there. Not only a repeat offence on one individual, but very often on several people. And again, that's looking, you know, there's a call in England for um, a um, serial perpetrator register, you know, or stalker register in relation to domestic violence crimes, because we do have people that are repeat offenders and they're coming from other jurisdictions, and we've no way of linking that up through the, the databases and systems that we have at the moment. So, you know, it is just something that we would like um, the committee to consider because of the repeat nature of the crime. Okay, and at uh, clause 26 uh, around the cross-examination in person, um, it, the submission there talked about the, the, the prohibition would only apply where there was a criminal conviction or court order, 
uh, and you're suggesting that that should be extended to direct cross-examination in proceedings where there's allegations around domestic violence and abuse. Um, do you want to just elaborate on that for us? Yeah, as I said earlier, you know, um, someone who is, you know, intimidated and vulnerable in a criminal court is intimidated and vulnerable, you know, in any court. And I think it's, um, you know, I've been to court with women to support them and it's extremely daunting. Um, experience for anyone and cross-examination should not be allowed if there's any allegation of abuse so we're very very clear on that that we think it should take into a consideration even if there is um, allegations as well you know you're going to get better evidence as well mm -hmm. you know because all it takes is for that person one look and that's them and they just want to run out the courthouse because I've been been there with them. That's all it takes. And that's a high powerful coercive and controlling behaviour can be. And you're losing your whole sense of self. So it's just um, the understanding of the impact of the whole court process is very difficult. So anything we can do to get better evidence, and, and that would be one thing that we do think, you know, is a, a huge factor. Okay. Linda, was there a point you wanted to come back to? It's on? just a tiny point on, yeah, on sure. the, the issue you raised there, Chair, on aggravating factors. Just given some of the evidence around the fact that when a woman is, is pregnant, particularly in, with her first pregnancy, that that can very often be the, the instigator of abuse, or at least it can heighten the, the abuse. Should there be something in there around that, do you think? or? Well, I suppose it could be around vulnerabilities and it could be um, the interpretation in of, of a more general vulnerability. I think it could be added um, within that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sonia, can I thank you very much? Um, your, your submission has been excellent and your engagement around the questions has been very helpful to the, the committee, which we will, we will use. And if there's anything that we need to come back to you on, hopefully you can help us with that. But um, thank you very much on behalf of the committee. It's much appreciated. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity um, to be here today in person as well. And, um, you know, we really appreciate all the work that the committee is doing in relation to the bill and the Department of Justice too. And we really do think um, this has such an opportunity to make changes to the lives of all victims. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, members. Um, it's going to ring. And they'll ring in. Members just take their ease for one minute and um, the next witness is going to be um, dialing in so we'll commence that in a couple of minutes members. Is that Rhonda? Rhonda, you're, you're very welcome to the uh, committee. If, we'll, we'll just give you a couple of minutes and we'll, we'll commence this session in about two minutes' time. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.
as well. So. Okay, members, we're, we're, we'll make a start on next next item on the agenda. So, for members' benefit, it's pages forty nine uh, to sixty one of uh, your meeting pack. And uh, if I can thank uh, Rhonda uh, Lusty, who is the coordinator in the men's advisory project, for joining with us via the teleconferencing uh, facility. Uh, uh, Rhonda, you're very welcome. Just to advise you that the, the meeting will be recorded by Hansard, and then that will be. Uh, published in due course. So in the committee room, there's myself and uh, Linda Dillon and Rachel Woods, and then joining on uh, the line like yourself, we've got Paul Frew, Sinead Bradley, Doug Beatty, and uh, Gemma. So uh, I I'm going to ask you, Rhonda, at this stage, if you can just give a, a brief overview um, of your submission, and then uh, members are going to have some questions uh, in respect of the uh, clauses. If you're content with that approach, then I'll hand over to you. Hi. Um, just trying to check how the levels are. I can hear you very well. Can you hear us? Yes, yeah, of course. Um, so, my name is Rhonda Lusty, and I'm the coordinator of the Men's Advisory Project. Um, we're the lead regional charity specialising in support for men and the and their children who have endured or enduring abuse. Over 21 years, we've been at the forefront of shaping and coordinating response to domestic abuse for men. We do that through trauma-focused practice and it's always shaped by survivor experience, although led by clinical excellence. Um, at heart, we are a specialist service for male survivors of domestic abuse for children. Um, we would welcome the introduction of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. We're grateful to all involved in moving the bill forward, from Minister Ford and Minister Sugden, to eventual creation of the dedication of Minister Long and her team. The Department of Justice have been central to the quality of the proposed bill, and they have undertaken extensive work while drafting this legislation in consultation with voluntary and statutory organisations to ensure that they've had a strong sense of the victim's voice other jurisdictional experience and practitioner experience. We also would like to thank the Chair and Deputy Chair of the Justice Committee for your immediate focus on the domestic abuse bill. Um, once the Assembly was restored, we really appreciate your exhortation that they will be brought via the Assembly. So, Matt, would like to particularly commend everyone for the hard work and thought involved and welcome the opportunity to comment on the proposed bill. We're glad to hear Minister Long say um, it's important that we recognise that anyone can be a victim and that abuse itself can take many forms. This is important because there was at the first time a recognition of um, the width and breadth of both abuse and those who can suffer. So we would highlight again that domestic abuse can be inflicted on anyone and by anyone regardless of gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, class, education, race, colour, age, nationality, disability. So we would ask that we need equal protection for all victims and survivors under the law. And we applaud the Assembly and Ministers for ensuring that the bill remains gender neutral in its language. I think it was important for us to put some statistics in our response um, because um, I think many people are surprised by how many victims of domestic abuse are male. And so in our response, we included um, some, you know, quite easily gained statistics, but we wanted to also um, show you some statistics from the PSNI and the Northern Ireland Crime Survey. And to show those in tandem, because we felt that that would be able to provide a more accurate overview of the amount of domestic abuse going on in society. So um, we begin by showing that five male victims of domestic abuse. Um, there are five male victims of domestic abuse per thousand of the male population. That 32 men have lost their lives to domestic homicide in Northern Ireland. And that's 41 percent of all the domestic homicides in Northern Ireland. Um, that 35% of domestic abuse faced by men is interfamilial and is 
not from a partner or ex-partner. And that the police in Northern Ireland were only made aware of just only, uh, of over a third of the worst types of domestic partner abuse, according to the Northern Ireland Crime Service, meaning that they were unaware of the experiences of six in ten victims. It's statistically clear that many men face extensive domestic abuse. But I think Map's point of view is that, is that if we now widen our lens and look at how we view domestic abuse, we're better able to assess domestic abuse, to include all men, and to offer adequately funded services, then these statistics would increase. We, of course, know that the very great suffering of many women who are also victims of domestic violence. And any proposed legislation should support and protect all victims. However, as this is the response from the only specialist agency supporting male victims, we will, by the majority, focus on responses on men and our replies. So I think from this point, we're really happy to speak to you regarding the clauses and any answers that you might want to give us. Does that... Are you happy enough with that as a preamble? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Rhonda. And um, that's given us a good overview. Uh, obviously, members will have read your, your submission. Um, and there's just a few questions that I'll start with, um, which you, you hopefully can just elaborate on. Uh, I, l let me take you through some of them in the order as they appear uh, based on the bill. Clause 2 in Chapter 1, I was interested in this one from, from yourselves, and that was to do with spiritual abuse. Um, yeah. If you want to just provide a little bit of context to, to the concerns around um, the spiritual abuse aspect of, of this. I know um, you, this might be something that people overlook, but actually, in fact, we would see a fair amount of it. So, um, for people who are in course of, or controlling an abusive relationship, they might enter into that relationship either from a mixed marriage or from someone who is strongly of one religion and they themselves hold no real religion. And through the course of that relationship, they either have their spirituality and religion eradicated or um, forced into um, or forced into um, someone else's religion. Additionally, we would see that where there's a child um, and a child's victim, that quite often um, the, the child will be used as part of the spiritual abuse. So it might be that two parents have decided that the children will be brought up within one religion, and then upon separation, the resident parent decides that that will no longer be the case and the child has moved to school or moved to religion or that they decide that the children will be brought up with no religion and you know, and, and in an integrated school life and things like that, and conversely will then be pushed into religion. So we would see men who would have been quite affected by spiritual abuse. And additionally, we would see um, gay bi and trans men who will have been abused through spiritual abuse, through focus on outing them. Um, so some gay, bi and trans men have very rich lives within the church but are not out. And we sometimes see that they themselves um, are threatened and abused through um, threats to out them to their church community and destroy that link to their spiritual life. Okay, no, thank you. Um... Uh, well, one, yeah, yes, yes, no, I, I do, and I, I'm trying to, in considering all of that, um, where you maybe, on that issue and others, you end up the child, for example, being engaged in a tug of war and, and so on, as to w what rights then does the child have to influence those type of decisions and, and how you can frame legislation or, around that aspect of it? Yeah, it's... it's it's an interesting point of view, but it's also interesting when we consider how difficult it is for us to speak about religion still within our society, you know. And so quite often we see, um, you know, gentle human beings 
being pushed and coerced out of something which enriches them spiritually. So, and that can cause great distress and anxiety to them and to their wider family. Yeah, okay. Um, if, if I can just move on to an, another ground just that uh, you've mentioned. Um, let me just find it. Yeah, in terms of the penalty for the offence, that it was clause 14 in your submission, um, a, a requirement for the police to implement the child contact orders. Could you just elaborate on that aspect of your submission? Yes. Yeah. Currently what happens is, um, sort of, I think a lot of men would believe that the, the golden ticket is um, when they receive a child um, contact order. Um, the difficulty being that very many child contact orders are not adhere, adhered to. Now, we're not talking about situations where um, contact is being withheld because the parent is um, dangerous or the, they present a fear to the child. We're speaking on behalf of men who have been abused or who have faced a long period of coercive or abusive behaviour. So I think we must frame it in that way to begin with. So the withholding of children and the igno ignorance of child contact arrangements, we would see a lot. And the police, when asked to, you know, to enact these orders, are really reticent to do so. The police themselves would say that they see it as a civil matter, even though it is a court order, and would say that they don't want to cause more harm by going in and sort of taking children from one place to take them to another, and would hope that the parents will do a better job. But what we see instead is court orders being ignored and ignored, and then, in fact, the only option is to move to the criminal court for a contempt of court, and then at that point it is pushed from the criminal court straight back down to the family court, and it's a sort of circular process. So is that, is that more an issue? Um, I, I know, I suppose, the place in delivering those things maybe gives a, a greater sense of the seriousness around it, um, but is it is it more appropriate to be looking at a stiffer approach in the court system uh, of non-compliance with court orders and the, the actual process or mechanism for delivery um, can, can be looked at, but is the focus not more about that the, the court and the, the offence for not complying rather than who delivers it? I think um, it's an interesting piece because, of course, if you're someone who has spent years and thousands of pounds trying to ensure that you have reasonable and decent contact with your children and you believe that what you have is the protection of the court and yet court orders are constantly frustrated and no one protects the implementation of them and no one works to implement them. I think it either has to be something that is the function of the court or it's something that we're able to do in tandem with the PSNI. Yeah. Okay, uh, can I ask just then, in Clause 26 around the proceedings, court examination, um, uh, you made some comments around this. If you just want to elaborate a little bit, it was under the, the prohibition of cross-examination in person. Uh, one, one of the, the comments in your submission um, was getting uh, legal representation where there's a view that um, people are knowingly accused in the wrong by their complainant and, and then getting representation for parity of arms uh, around representation. Um, uh, do you want to just comment on, on that and, and any other aspect of the that aspect of Clause 26? Um, I think the first thing we'd like to say is that um, we wholeheartedly agree with the idea of special measures and protections for those who um, have to give evidence for domestic abuse or coercive control. We absolutely see that there must be a right to protection for those 
for those people who have suffered abuse, our difficulty comes where there isn't an equality of arms between the complainant and the accused. Uh, um, so what we would like to see is that in those situations that legal representation will be allowed to be given to um, whomever, you know, generally the, 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 the man who's having to respond to these. As it works currently, legal aid is not often available in these situations, and that is what's caused these, dif these terrible difficulties in prior times. Of course, legal aid would have been available to both parties, and there wouldn't have been a situation where um, uh, someone who was accused of domestic abuse might be directly questioning um, a, a complainant of domestic abuse. So we just have to make sure that in this situation that there's a fairness and an equality for both and to ensure that the court is able to do it not sufficiently. OK, and the last one for, for me. I was interested in the recommendation for a uh, specialist domestic abuse court. Um, do you want to just elaborate on, on why you would feel that's necessary? I'm just trying to find that in my... It, in it, my practice. It, it, it's not it, it's not mentioned in the legislation. It was one of the areas that MAP had highlighted. You know that there was a gap uh, and was suggesting that um, a, a specific um, specialist court around domestic abuse w would be something. Yeah, uh, I think um, this had come from. First of all, we had seen what was happening in soil and um, some of the very good moves that were happening under Judge McElholm and under the um, under the protections offered up in Derry, London Derry. So um, what we had wanted to see was that this was somewhere where civil and sorry, family and criminal courts could speak to each other and were aware of the things that were happening. So we would see, for instance, um, extensive use of harassment happening in the criminal court, and then in tandem, um, abuse happening in the family court, or, or cases moving forward in family courts, and neither court were speaking to each other. Um, and this, and an association where when court orders are, are being ignored and moved to criminal and back to family, we felt that it would be more appropriate that we would start to move away from this sort of piecemeal answer toward a specialist domestic court. Yeah. Okay. No, it's 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 definitely one that I'm interested in whether or not we can legislate for how the courts structure themselves. I, I'm not sure, but it may be something that we're able to to look at. So um, thank, thank you for that. I want to bring in members now, uh, Rhonda, if that's okay with you. Um, Paul Frew. Yes, Chair, thank you. And thank you, Rhonda, for your attendance here and for your uh, questions and answers. Uh, can I take it across five from the, uh, and the family connection? Clause. Uh, let me just let me just flip through my own pages here to get to it. Uh, you, you highlighted a concern in your paper about making sure that every family, believable family, can is gained. Um, Talked about foster uh, children I think at a time or. or uh, yeah, what, what specific wording do you think needs to be applied to five or five in order to encapsulate every scenario? I think for us, some of the things we, by and large, we think that this is an excellent bill, by the way. But I think there are some areas which can do with tweaking. Um, when we look at something like personal connection, we were really pleased to see that Affinity covered many of the relationships where 
a person could have a position of influence over another person. But one of the areas where we saw missing was through people who are involved in kinship care or foster care. Um, and to include where families are not set up in a typical way. So foster carers, for example, may be long-term foster carers. And whilst that child might not become an adopted child within that family, it's not to say that that relationship would not be similar to personal connection or affinity as should be covered. I think it's difficult because when you ask me about how it should be worded, I understand that when the bills are being drafted, they're drafted in a way to try and make them as wide as possible. Yes. But in situations where we speak definitely about, you know, these are the things, we have seen where things fall outside it and they're left in a limbo. So when we were aware of that, we would often see difficulties in kinship and foster care. So that was something that we thought it important to bring up in front of the committee. Okay. We we had a I had a question in the last um, session where we talked about the possibility of dogging clause uh, to to cover as much as possible victims of dogging before we have a stop bill before us. Uh, and, and of course, the danger that we might not get to a stocking bill at this firm, uh, and so that it would add protection. What's your thoughts on adding a stocking element to this um, bill? That would be an offence. And also, how do we connect a victim of stocking who hasn't actually been captured in those definitions of a personal connection? I think the difficulty with stalking is that, of course, stalking uh, involves people who are not only within an affinity. So I think the issue is that, of course, stalking also involves many people who have been, you know, uh, there is no relationship, so there's someone who's been seen on the street. There's someone who has been worked with or met in the bus. So my understanding was that to include and to add stalking into this bill, it would be inappropriate because it would be both uh, relationships which are personal and infinity, as in covered within this bill, but also have to inc include all of the public. So we were very grateful to see um, the work that was being carried out by the Department of Justice whilst the Assembly um, wasn't able to work. And we were also very grateful to see that, of course, the, the Justice Minister had spoken about her intent to bring forward stalking legislation um, in addition to this legislation. And I think that actually um, we thought that that is the right way to go. Yeah. Because to cover the full range of stalking and the seriousness and um, dramatic impact it can have on people, I think it's something which needs to be really properly worked upon, consulted, and to show both the um, personal and intimate side, and additionally the, the public and much more random side of stalking. Both are dangerous and both can end in death, but we must, you know, adequately address them for for both sides of of stalking and harassment. Okay. So can I ask you about clause, clause 9 then, um, regards to the real fear that a lot of people have, but particularly men around uh, uh, residents, children, uh, residents, and you put a figure there, 97% of residents they, of children go to the, the, uh, the mother. A female in a relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what's your thoughts on that? Furthermore, to the, your presentation, um, how do you think that can be addressed? Because obviously, this is bound to be a massive hindrance for uh, people who are victims of domestic violence, 
receiving the environment of which, where they're abused, and then for fear even of child being abused, you would you would stick in there, stay in that environment, protect the child. Uh, what's your thoughts on all of that? I mean, we support the provision of clause nine, um, and for the aggravation to exist where a child becomes involved, but isn't the primary intended recipient of, of abuse. Um, MAP, of course, do not and have never accepted the children passively witness abuse, um, and we see them as victims in their own right. But their being victims in their own right is multi layered and can unfortunately also include when they are used as pawns or leverage to further control parents. Now, sometimes the children aren't aware that this is going on, but sometimes the children are manipulated in a way that they are, and, and this can only look like abuse of children, because it puts immense pressure upon the children. So we would see and hear from many, many men who have faced the most terrible forms of abuse. Um, and they're having to face this in front of their children, where the children both hear, witness, and are horribly affected by it. It means that they often speak of no options other than to comply with the wishes of their abuser um, and to reduce the greater effect of harm on the children they they will leave. Recognition has to be made that children can be used um, to to abuse by a, you know by the means of erosion of, of respect and love of the parents. Because we see many men remain incoercively controlling and domestically abusive relationships simply down to the threat of never seeing their children again or the fear of how abuse will be enacted on those children if they're forced to leave the home. So quite often we hear of men being told, you will never see your kids again. Um, and unfortunately, we see that quite often that might happen. Now, when we speak about 97% of residents is granted to women, that is, for very many cases, perfectly happy. But we're not speaking about the happy situation. We're speaking about the situation where there's domestic abuse. And we're speaking about the situation where there's no reason why children should not be with their parents, both parents, and that those parents are both safe, but more where there's a manipulation um, and a further abuse of the man by withholding the child, destroying the relationship, and you know, and this kind of quite knowing abuse and how we how we attend to it and pay attention to it. Yes. And I suppose it's not even a residency being uh, awarded to the if that's the right word to the woman. It's the actual breaking then of any arrangements uh, of access whereby games can be played where children can be left off or dropped off in different places. Um, arrangements can change at the last minute. That makes it very difficult then for the the, the partner or father or mother then to actually uh, get to the child in time, which disrupts also for a weekend or for a night's stay. Uh, is that something that's prevalent within your organisation that you see on a daily basis in containment wise? Yeah, we see that all the time. I mean, quite often what we would say is um, a father getting a pattern of, say, maybe uh, one one night midweek plus um, every other weekend. And that seems to be a quite typical pattern. Um, but in the one night midweek, um, you will always find that, um, or very often find, sorry, that children will suddenly have lots of activities placed in that night. So children here in their life have never gone to gymnastics or GB or whatever it is, will suddenly, that will be their night. So this time that they should be spending with their father and that their father has long looked forward to, 
is suddenly eaten up and lots of things. And in fact, all they get is, you know, the 10 minutes before bedtime. And then over time, children are encouraged that actually perhaps it would be easier if they didn't go. So it's not always simply about, um, you know, the, the terrible things. It can be about people not being able to hold their adult feelings ill in. So how we address how the parental bond is encouraged and kept a sacred kind of almost so that, you know, separated parents don't speak badly of each other. They still use the word dad. They still would encourage children to go. They don't put blocks or barriers in the way. And certainly the idea isn't that they create a situation which is so hostile that eventually the child ends all contact with the parent or by abusive orders the, the parent the, the, the father doesn't see the child for such a long time that it's incredibly difficult to re-establish a pattern of um, father-child relationship Yes, okay and a few other small questions then uh, Clause 22 you talk about um, making sure that even for a generic uh, crime where there's maybe evidence of domestic violence involvement, that that should be up in clause 22 also with regards to special measures directions and support. Uh, again, have you thought about actually how that would be worded then and, and, and how it could be encapsulated? But also then the final point is around parents of one partner, uh, the abusive partner, using court in a way to dwindle finances of the other uh, by, by getting them into court quite often uh, the abuser being able to be, uh, get legal aid but the victim not and then not dwindling in a way their resources finance and wealth I'm sorry I didn't I didn't get I didn't get the first part of your question sorry the, the first question was around the special measures uh in court for, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of caveats there, clauses, sub-clauses there where you can go into special measures. If you have it in your submission about, even if it's a gene generic fight, being investigated and being going through the courts, that if there is evidence that uh, domestic violence, then that can also be picked up uh, with regards to special measures direct. I think in order for us to have any understanding that justice needs to be seen to be done, that if a person is vulnerable or if there's a suggestion that a person is vulnerable, that special measures should be provided to them. And that's whether that's um, a mother, a father or a child or anyone else within the you know, affinity situation. But um, the second part of your question it was about the oh. dwindling of resources using the court as a weapon uh, to yeah. remove wealth from a, a, the victim. Yes, so we could see the sort of, I guess, in, in different research it would be called abusive legal process. Um, so quite often we will see that one parent will have legal aid and the other parent will not. Um, and one parent will, you know, be back and forward to court endlessly. And eventually what happens is um, one parent is simply unable to afford it and unable to carry on. And there's such a, a detrimental effect to their mental health and the feeling that this will never end under any circumstances. But sometimes it's really hard for them to see how to move forward. And we've seen very many men suicidal and with really terrible effects on their mental health post this happening. We would, of course, say that this isn't in all cases or even many cases, 
but we do see it in a significant number of cases. And I think it's fair to say that if we were to have a court which was used and able to be see this as a wider issue, I think the court might be able to better direct what was happening. I mean, there's on occasion we will see people who've spent forty thousand pounds trying to have contact with the child. Um, and actually that parent has never been accused of any domestic abuse, any sexual abuse or anything which would make you frightened to have the parent with the child. But abusive orders and constant back and forward to the court means that they will not have seen their child for years. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, thank you. Rachel. Um, thank you. I have a number of my questions have been answered, but um, just sort of generic ones, Rhonda. Um, with regard to the domestic abuse and course of control conducted on sort of online or on digital platforms, I know you'd mentioned this in your submission. Um, is this something that comes up a lot to MAP? And how do you feel um, if it's sufficiently covered in this legislation? Do you feel it needs a wee bit more? I think we see. Thanks for the question, Rachel. Hi. Um, I think we see a fair bit of it. Um, I think as, as we move forward as a society, we see that increasingly people will use digital platforms and um, communications, really, to be abusive to each other. Um, so some of them are you know, the kind of obvious text message WhatsApp sort of thing. But there have been other situations where we've seen, you know, Facebook campaigns, quite terrible, you know, ab abusive situations being set up. So would we say we see it a lot? We would say we see it a lot in terms of abuse via um, social media. But sometimes we do see really extreme cases of abuse via Facebook accounts, social media accounts, those sorts of things. Um, we were heartened to see it within the bill, if I'm honest. You were heartened to see what in the bill, sorry? We were heartened to see um, the inclusion of online communication within the bill. Oh, you would like to see that? Okay, thank you for that one. And in terms of um, something that has been brought up by other submissions is the creation of a domestic abuse commissioner or a similar sort of scrutiny body or critical friend. Um, would that be something that you would support? Um, I think it's hard for me to fully support the idea of a commissioner. Um, I think I took quite seriously what the Minister said about the cost. One of the things I thought might be useful is that we would have a champion, perhaps, someone who was a better conduit between government and, um, and the other sectors, but someone who was able to try and get the better and best working. So I think that's something I would be happier to see than perhaps the commissioner, <coughs> but it's certainly not something that we're up, you know, that we're against, and it's something that I'd be happy to be involved in further conversation about. But I think, especially given the lack of funding available, I would really want to see if it's going, you know, I'd really want to see the, the benefits of the commissioner versus, say, the champion. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, just in terms of um, strangulation, this came up in your submission as well. Would you see what would like to see this separately as legislation, or would you would like to see it included perhaps in clause two? Um, I guess we had looked at it as a separate piece of legislation, um, but in um, post in the same way that we would imagine um, stalking. Uh, I think also we had seen it in that way because 
the work to try and bring forward this bill and to have, try and have people understand coercive control and the training necessary, not only for all our first responders, but for society, a, a, you know, a wider society. Um, the idea of then also trying to bring in strangulation, I think, I think, there, I think it would add too many elements. Well, this is something that is vital that we understand and vital that there would be a campaign on, uh, in and of its own right for that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Rhonda, for your presentation. Um, quite a bit of, of what I would, would want to cover has been covered already by, by the, the Chair and by Rachel and obviously by, by your own brief, which I'm very grateful for. And thank you for the manner in which you did your submission, going through each clause, that actually is very helpful. Um, so just a few s small questions. Rhonda, the first one, just seeing clause eight, obviously you've, you've raised the issue around the victim being under 18 and the, and the perpetrator being over 18, and a wee bit of concern about if there's only a couple of months between them. Can I just yeah. can I just clarify that your concern is that that perpetrator would not be treated the same as though the child the, the younger person were sixteen? You you want them to be treated the same as though the the gap the age gap were were more? Are you concerned yeah. that? Go ahead. So I guess what we were we were just trying to highlight that in these situations sometimes there has to be nuance. So we, what we wouldn't want to happen is that if there's a relationship between someone who's 18 and a half and 17 and a half, that the person who's 18 and a half is hit with an aggravator in a way that, um, that you know, will be prosecuted in a way that another person would not be. So I think there was something in and around just making sure that there was a nuance to ensure that we, you know, that we were doing this in a thoughtful way. So you actually think it should be nuanced? So if somebody was, for example, 18 years and two months and, and the victim was 17 years and nine months, that that would be very different to a victim who was 15 or 16 and a perpetrator who was 25? Is that yeah, I think... Because I do think that youth is a is a course of vulnerability, but it's interesting to think that youth is only, you know, it's considered a vulnerability up and until seventeen and three hundred and sixty four days. Yeah. So I think there, I think we have to be sensible, but I would imagine that I mean, I think a lot of the things when we look at the act. As it sits here, I think we can be very fearful of how it might work. But I think quite soon, when we would start to use it, we would see the problems and the things that are, um, you know, where, where something's going to create a problem or where something is not going to create a problem. I think, so for instance, in that case, I would hope that the PS and I, when they were looking at it, would use good judgment that the PPS, when they were looking at it, would use good judgment. But it is still something to highlight in our submission, because I think it's something that we must consider as a new one. OK. Thank, thank you, Rhonda. And just in relation to Clause 12, then, obviously you've, you've highlighted your concerns around it, and concerns were also highlighted by, by the previous um, brief by women's aid, do you think it should be removed or or just that sort of it needs to be tightened up or t tidied up in terms of what exactly that would mean? Which would be your preference? Pre preference, I think. It might look for a tweak. I, you see, we appreciate the rationale for us. We really do. Yeah. Um, and also... Without it being there, I think the necessary safeguards for those who need them won't won't be there. 
Um, so I think Northern Ireland is a place where there is a healthy and robust scrutiny and discussion of decisions through the for judicial review. So um, I think without the reasonableness defence, um, the reputation and integrity of the Act might be tarnished. Um, but it, it's different, of course. There should, of course, always be a burden to prove the reliance on the defence. And the defence should never be accepted when there would be any cause of fear or physical harm. But we would hope, of course, that when the police come to any event, you know, that they are able to quite clearly see if it is a course of action or if this is a one-off, you know, and they would be able to use a very good sense. And then if they felt that it should go to the PPS, the same thing. We have a series of checks and balances here. But I think we do also need to be able to have a reasonableness defence to allow people who absolutely <coughs> do need to protect those relatives, say, with dementia, or for those who are vulnerable in a way, that they, in, in, in a proper sense, that they are vulnerable and need to be safeguarded. And um, just in clause 14, then you had raised the fact that there are no perpetrator programmes for, for females and also the, just the lack of perpetrator programmes through, through the courts. I suppose just my query on that is, obviously we know that there, there has been a very poor uptake in what perpetrator programmes there are in terms of, of males. And do you think is a sort of, I suppose, for want of a better word, a forced programme actually the answer? Or is it, I mean, in any cases where we have programmes for young people to, you know, diversionary programmes, they're mostly voluntary. And that's because there is a feeling that if they're not voluntary, then, you know, they're being made to do it. That's why they're doing it. They're not really interested in, in trying to right the wrong or they don't believe they've done wrong. So. Is it not, would it not be a case that voluntary is the better way to go, particularly in this type of a of a crime? Because if a person doesn't believe they've done wrong, it's very difficult to put them into a programme to help them to learn to do right. I think um, you make some really good points, and we welcome the question. Um, we start with. Um, Judge McElholm, when he had the mandated court, mm -hmm. that it was very poorly taken up. And it was very poorly taken up because, of course, there was quite a knowing use of, um, you know, take this course or take your chances in court with the hope that there would be pressure placed upon um, the victim to withdraw statements and the chances of conviction would be lessened. So I think that these courses can quite often be attached to the domestic abuse protection orders um, whenever they're brought through because those orders are quite can have other powers and some of those can be that people are encouraged to take part in a course or take you know pr pr stop using substances get help for um, other issues that they might be suffering from which are um, exacerbating their use of behaviours which are frightening or abusive. Um, we think that if there were more opportunities for behaviour change programmes, and I mean all the way through from access to, to younger people from sort of 14 upwards, um, and if those courses were both mandated and non-mandated and were seen as a stigma and were something that was positively encouraged, we think that there could be a huge change. Thank you, Rhonda. I appreciate your answer. And, and just lastly, just a comment. I think the Chair's comment around the special domestic or the question around the special domestic abuse court and your response to it is is very interesting i think that you're probably right that whenever you're 
dealing in a vacuum in the family courts, not knowing what's happening in the criminal court. You're very often not perhaps having the right outcome. You could have a very different outcome to many of the, the cases that come to a family court if they were aware of what's going on in the criminal court. So I think that is something that, that would be interesting to look at in moving forward. So I think that was a good point that you were picked up on. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, uh, any other members on the line? Um, Sinead Bradley, I'll come to you first. Thank you, thank you Rhonda. Um, yeah, just asking about the international offer and your second last paragraph you refer to that about the um, court having an understanding or connection about what's happening. And earlier in your document you talked about um, access to legal aid and there are circumstances where you're aware where we have unchallenged and received a caution. Um, and no doubt then that will change the picture. But the main of these reflective purposes have to stop something like contradicting and another point, I just like to elaborate on the an apology because it maybe um, I couldn't hear it very well. In your final paragraph, um, there are other you very clearly point out, and I do get it, um, the problem that surrounds um, the, basically the implication for somebody who has an allegation to be made and that. In, in our haste and in our correctly in our haste um, to immediately surround the victim or the alleged victim at that point, that that then could be read into that a fact rather than something that has to be examined. So there is, I, I really did get that, highlight that very well. I'm so but sorry, I have to say, I can't start. hear you. Um, yeah. I'm I'm really uh, sorry to say so. No, that's fine. Right. Apologies. I can pick this up with you. Um, I, I apologize. I know it's not the deal. Apolo I'm so sorry, but if anyone else... Yes, sorry. Able... Apologies, Rhonda. Um, uh, apologies, then, Sinead, as well. We're, we're just not quite picking up all, all of the, okay, the, the conversation sure. on that. So I'm that, so sorry. No, you're okay. It's the nature of the technology. Um, Doug Beatty, are you on the line? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still on the show, Paul. Thank you. Um, actually, you asked my question, which was about court orders, so, so um, I don't really have any questions. I just want to thank Rhonda for uh, an incredibly good and informative uh, presentation and, and the, the answering of the questions, uh, which really has uh, been, been good. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rhonda. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, Gemma? No, I just want to thank Rhonda, but I have no questions. Okay. Thanks so much, Th Thank you, Gemma. And um, mm -hmm. Rhonda, can I can I thank you very much um, for presenting to the committee and and the the detailed way in which you've been able to answer those questions. It's certainly uh, been very informative for the committee members. And um, if there's any other issues that we want to to follow up with you once we've taken other evidence and, and reached considered views on it, I'm, I'm sure you'll be more than happy to engage with us um, if we need to write to um, you to follow up. I'm sure um, mention has been made of gay by trans men during um, perhaps I, I didn't get to hear Sonia's um, evidence of course um, but it's something that we felt would be quite wrong of us to leave without speaking to the Justice Committee about. Um, are you happy for me to speak a little bit about that, or just, must you get on? And on, on what issue, sorry? Um, issues which particularly face gay, bi and trans men. In, in respect of the legislation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we do need to vacate the room in about 10 minutes, okay. so if, <laughs> if, you, if you want to make a, a comment very briefly, and, and then we'll have it on the record. Fine. Um, we would see um, about 11% of the men who come to us um, would be gay by a charm. Um, but there are multiple circumstances where domestic abuse occurs and when it occurs with gay, bi and trans men, they might not be supported in the same way that 
someone in a heterosexual or heteronormative relationship would be. So quite often it might be assumed that it's a fight or it might be assumed, you know, that things are going to be okay. So um, we really want to highlight that these things through, flow through all relationships and that when we talk about domestic abuse, we would really, really ask that each of the committees, you know, widen their lens. And that wouldn't just suggest that we ask that you widen the lens for men, but that you pay specific attention to what happens to gay, bi and trans men as well. They themselves can experience unique forms of course of control because we see them being controlled through um, their sexual orientation, HIV status, um, religious practice, or even their gender identity. So we really wanted to make sure that when we do a big education and advertising piece on this bill, that we make sure that we reference not only men, but especially gay, bi and trans men. Okay, thank you. We we have that um, in the in the written submission. I think you elaborate um, in more detail on that and other aspects as well. So be assured that the evidence that we've received in, in writing will, will be considered by the committee um, in addition to your oral comments. So I uh, appreciate that. So th thank you very much, Rhonda. Thank you, and thank you for asking us today. Not at all. Pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Nick. -bye. Okay, members. Um, I appreciate your, I appreciate your, your patience there, and just trying to work with us. And in terms of the technology, we're we're hoping that we'll get an upgrade for future meetings by way of the Starleaf application, and uh, that, that should make it a little bit easier for for members and for the next uh, evidence session. So, if members can bear with me, um, the uh, the next item on the agenda just th th those two evidence sessions obviously we'll collate all of that information it'll feed into our consideration um we, we will continue to take the evidence from all the other groups that we will um, be hearing um and, and obviously we can come back to, to some of these things once we consider it at a future point yeah, can i can i jump in there just for me second sure uh, Chair, can i just raise the issue on the bill folder, which is a very, very good uh, document in the way we can get it. But I, I seem, I, I can't find the, the hand sword for this second reading. Uh, as, I un as I understand it, hands are struggling in terms of getting things reported um, in, their, in the normal time frame that they usually do. Okay, that's clear enough. Fair. Sorry, Paul, is that the Hansard for the second stage debate? Yes, yeah, second stage debate. Yeah. No, we do have that. Um, we'll contact you after the meeting, but we do have it. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Okay, um, let, let me push on, members. Um, item 6 is the Domestic Abuse Draft Committee report, and uh, the relevant pages are 64 to 70. Um, any typographical or formatting errors in the report will be amended at the proofing stage before circulating to MLAs and, and publication on the committee web page. So unless there's any proposed amendments to the draft report, then I need to take members just through the formality of it. If you're content, then I'll proceed. Um, are members content that the title page, contents page and committee membership and powers page stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. Content. Are members content that the background section at paragraphs one to four stand part of the report? Agreed. 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 Um, are members content that paragraphs five to seven, which outline the purpose of the legislative consent motion, stand part of the report? Agreed. Okay, Agreed. thank you. Are members content that paragraphs eight to eleven, which detail the committee's consideration of the legislative consent motion, stand part of the report? Agreed. 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 Are members content that the conclusion section at paragraph twelve stand part of the report? Agreed. And are, Agreed. Are members content that the appendices stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, if members are content that you would um, agree that I can clear the draft minutes of today's meeting to include an appendix two, that allows the report to be finalised. The draft minutes will then be replaced by the final version of which the committee will be asked to agree, if members are content with that approach. Agreed. And if members are content that the report will be published on the committee page and issued to all MLAs. Agreed. 
Okay. Um, the committee staff will notify members when a debate uh, or a date for the debate on the LCM has been uh, scheduled. Um, I've no chairman's business. I do want to go back to the matter arising um, from earlier in the meeting. It's a response from the Minister uh, of Justice following the uh, motion that was debated in the Assembly uh, on Tuesday that Doug Beatty had brought forward. Um, the Minister uh, sent a response that we got uh, yesterday, and hopefully members have had an opportunity now just to, to find that during the course of the meeting. In summary, uh, the Minister is advising um, that to, to, to assist and inform frontline officers in respect of health and wellbeing challenges that they face, um, that uh, this review uh, could be um, conducted. So she's inviting a small number of suitably qualified individuals that would undertake a short, focused review of the support mechanisms and procedures in place in the prison service and to advise her if there's more that could or should be done to help frontline staff. Um, the Minister, in her letter, indicates that um, she'll ensure that those appointed to undertake the review will engage with the committee and trade union partners in making their assessment. Um, so, D Doug, I, I wanted just to invite you in at this stage, um, if you wish to comment on the letter. Um, yeah, if I can, please, Chair. Chair, I, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's really welcome. I, I think it was a good debate, um, and I got an awful lot from it. I thank you, um, Paul Crew and Rachel, for their support, and, and I think uh, the, the input um, from elsewhere was, was really, really positive. So, although the, the motion fell, I, I think it's raised a, a larger debate, and, and I think everybody uh, can, can see that. Um, so, I welcome the letter, but, and, I, and I don't want to sound unappreciative, but, but I reflect on two things. First of all, the minister didn't even bother to turn up for the debate about her workforce. Um, uh, of course, she didn't have to turn up. But the moral component is what is important here. And if it was my workforce, I'd have been sitting there. So I reflect on that. And the second thing I reflect on is a written response to a written question for myself when I asked that she would engage with the Department for Finance in regards to the inefficiency sickness absence policy. And her flat answer was no, she would not. So, so where I welcome the letter, I, I hope it's not just out there as a knee-jerk to a very positive debate in the Assembly, but it's actually thinking about doing something extremely positive um, and, and identifying the issues that we got from both sides of the House, the supporters and those who didn't support, who raised good issues. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Um, Linda Dillon? Just a couple of things to say. I, I also welcome the letter, and I think... I would appreciate knowing who the, the suitably qualified persons would be. Um, I think, in, in fairness to Doug, we all supported the intent of the motion right across the House, and, and I think he's, he's captured that correctly. And in that vein, something which I said in, in, in my, during the debate, I think we should follow through in this committee, is that we as committee members should actually follow through on this in terms of what can we do to improve the conditions, the working conditions and, and overall conditions in terms of um, prison officers and some of that will be work done around the prisons and the, pres and the prisoners themselves but it is all in a vein to improve um, conditions for prison staff and I think it is important that we actually do have a focus on this and I'm hopeful that the Minister maybe will look a wee bit outside the box in terms of the suitably qualified people because there are people who engage with the prison service in terms of on behalf of prisoners issues but through that they have gained a real understanding of the challenges and difficulties for prison staff and they may well come from the voluntary sector voluntary and community sector and would be very empathetic towards the prison staff and probably to a certain degree would have a more rounded view of everything and how we really could tackle this and take it take it on and I think that it is something that is important going forward because the levels of sickness is not acceptable and I don't think it's entirely down to the fact that people are just deciding not to go to work it very evidently is to do with the conditions under which they work so I meant what I said in the chamber we need to tackle this before the the individuals become ill.
we need to prevent them from having to, to go down the route of taking time off work due to mental ill health because they're not getting the proper support services prior to that. But I also agree with, with Doug, whenever they, uh, they do reach a point where through mental ill health they do have to take time off, the proper support needs to be put in place and these people need to be looked after. Um, Rachel? Just very briefly, and just to pick up on Linda's point there, I suppose, is the suitable persons. I know there's a lot of steering groups and a lot of focus groups going on at the moment um, for various sectors of our society, but they're not actually talking to the people that it's actually affecting. So, you know, prison officers who are off, if possible, you know, with all the sort of GDPR and, and data protection guidelines, but um, if there is a, is a way to... Um, hear the voices of people who are actually affected by this policy. I would welcome that, uh, uh, them being the suitable people. Any other members on the line want to comment? Yeah, if I could come in, Chair. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I, I welcome the letter for, for the, the, uh, the content of it, but really the only important uh, paragraph is paragraph the sake, uh, page, which is her action. And it, I still think it skirts around the issue at hand and what Doug was emphasising in his debate, which is about the civil service policy, the fact that 6 percent of that policy is, 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 is directed towards present time, directed towards prison staff, and then about the warning letters and the two-year burden that that places on the prison staff. It doesn't really address that white issue of the civil service policy and how it is disproportionately affecting business staff. Okay. A, a couple of observations on on my part. Um, I think it's right to, to question what is suitably qualified and, and we're talking about in a context here where there's a a breakdown of trust in terms of where the rank and file are and what they feel that those in, in authority have been doing and a concern around what will be the independent nature of this review and, and so I think th there is justifiable cause to be asking questions about the independent nature of the review, who will head up that review and, and be part of that review team and it isn't just a tick box exercise that, um, that, 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 that then addresses what was uh, the issues raised in the motion. So um, I, I also raise another question. You obviously, the finance minister indicated uh, during the debate um, that uh, there was an urgent review taking place around the inefficiency language of these warnings that are issued. So how does this review um, run alongside what I thought was a welcome comment by the finance minister about looking at this and, and so ensuring that um, there's a, a joined up approach to the issues that were being raised. So I, I'm... Uh, content to suggest to members that you'll be right back to the Minister um, asking those questions um, because whoever would be appointed to this I think needs to have the confidence of the trade union representative bodies and, and the staff um, if, if you're going to then have um, trust in the outcome of what the review may, may lead to so you need to get it right at the start. So if we can ask questions around who would be appointed, um, the independent nature of the, the review uh, and also how it's going to liaise and engage with the Department of Finance's work in respect of those issues that are being raised. Um, and then when we get a response to that, we, we can pick, pick the matter up further unless there's any other suggestions members want to make. No, Chair, can you here? Could I just go on record to answer I absolutely agree. Um, Qualified persons, the qualified individual, um, is critical. And the fact that um, the, the closing line is the willingness to engage with the committee, which is welcome as well. Um, but I do think, I, but I think this really needs to be across the department um, from the outset for a, a change. Thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. D Doug, um, do you want to comment just on, on the suggested way forward for the committee? Um, sure. No, I listen. I, I've listened to yourself and, and Paul and to Linda, uh, and, and I think you have made some extremely good points. I think the letter um, asking some of those important questions uh, is, a, is a way to go ahead, and, and then we need to give time and space 
for them to do the review, and then we need to scrutinise that review, I think. So um, I I'm happy with what you're intending to do. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other members, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Just a tiny point. Yeah. Uh, the Minister also mentioned in their letter, obviously, the, the recent report, and I know that it actually was highlighted in the, in the paper on the day of the, the debate, and I did actually mean to mention it during the debate, because I do think that they should be, commi they should be commended in terms of the, the, the prison leadership and the staff, should be commended in terms of the improvements that have been made within the prison, and that has then, as I had stated, when, when it is made, prison is made better for prisoners, that has a knock-on effect and, and improves the lives of, of prison staff in terms of the, the reduction in physical attacks on them. Now, reduction is not enough. We don't want to see physical attacks on any public service staff, so I think that obviously there needs to be a lot more done, but I do think that there has been a lot of work done and everybody involved, and that should be commended. Okay, members, um, thank you, and we, we'll respond then as, as I've outlined and suggested to the committee, so I um, appreciate the, the feedback on that. Uh, is there any other business? Yes, Linda, no? Tell me today. Um, just in terms of the EU exit stuff, have we any idea of when we might be putting that in and could... Would it be possible, Chair, that we ask research to do a bit of work for us in terms of that, so that we have their papers prior to the department bringing papers forward? Because um, I think it would be useful to us for us to have as much information prior to the department's papers coming to us, if that's possible. Yeah, we can commission research, and I, it will depend on the timing and what you want, I, I, I how quickly they can do it, but well, is there any particular aspect you want? I take it it's to get the, what the current Just proposals the are vis-a-vis yeah. um, um, -vis how it interacts with the justice-related aspects of it um, would be the area. Specifically around the justices, okay. I suppose. I mean. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a chat and see between what the resources are, but um, well, we can commission yeah. something, yeah. Okay. Um, we're meeting then next Tuesday at 1 p.m. in room 30. Okay, members, so thank you. Meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.